Okay, so today, the Indie Survivor's Guide to Game Dev, we're going to talk about the absolute number one most asked question that I get in my whole life, right? I've been working in games for a very long time, and everybody always asks me, how do I break into the industry? How does my son break into the industry? How do, you know, everyone wants to know how you get involved in games. And I want to just start with a, a sort of, why should you listen to me and why am I making this video and who is this video for? So I get asked this question a lot and the answer to this is actually quite long and there's a lot of detail to it. And I want to give my official, complete, absolute answer to this question so that from now on, when anybody asks me this, I'll literally have a video on YouTube that I can send them the link and I can be like, here you go, watch this video. This is my absolute, complete answer to your question and you will have all the details and I'll never have to answer this question again. So that's why I'm making the video. So who's the audience? Who is this video intended for? Absolutely people who are in college or in high school and they're wondering how to get in the industry. People who are graduated from college and they're wondering if they can make a job shift into the game industry. Parents who have kids and they're wondering how can I get my kids into the game industry because that seems to be what they're interested in. Blah, blah, blah. All of those people, I will address all of your issues somewhere in this video, and I will tell you everything you need to know about getting into the game industry. That's my promise to you. Let's get started. All right. I want to start with a question that I don't think gets asked enough, and that is, are you sure you want a career in games? I mean, no. Are you really sure that you want a career in games? And People are like, oh, I love games. Games are all I want to do. I love, I, and my whole life is about games. I play video games. I get it. Games are fun. They're designed to be fun. That's what we make them do. That's our job is to make them fun. You're supposed to love games, right? That's not a special thing. You're not special because you love games. Everybody who plays games loves them. That's why we make them that way, right? I love rock and roll music. But becoming a rock and roll guitarist is not about loving rock and roll music. It's about spending a really long time learning how to play guitar and practicing scales and doing all kinds of shit that's really not much fun. And that's kind of the same thing, right? I love reading fantasy novels and reading a fantasy novel and loving fantasy novels and knowing all about fantasy novels. That's great. It doesn't make me an author. There's people that love watching football. That don't make you a quarterback, right? And video games are absolutely no different than that. The actual act of making a video game is such a different thing from the act of playing a video game. It's wildly, wildly different that a lot of people who think they want to be a game developer because they love playing video games, I would encourage you to stop and do a little bit more research, and this video will help with that, um, about what is an actual day of a video game developer look like? And I'll give you a hint. It doesn't look very much like playing video games. It looks a lot like work. It looks a lot like doing any other kind of software development or product development. And that's something you need to know going into it. That's thing one. Thing two, I will tell you fact up, most people who start in game development don't last. The average, last time I checked, the average lifespan of a game developer is less than five years. Uh, and depending on where you look, it's as low as like three. So most people who get into game development very quickly realize, I don't want to do this crap. This is way harder or it's different than I thought. It's not fun. The hours are long, blah, 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 blah. And they get out. So no, going into all of this, just, just the law of percentages, the law of averages says, if you get into game development, you are probably not going to stay in game development. That's an actual factual thing. So that's another thing you ought to know right up front. I will tell you a little bit about working in games. One of the main things you need to know about working in games is the hours are very long. This is the entertainment industry. Just like working in movies, just like working in film or music or anything else, you're not going to work a 40-hour work week. Now, I know that the internet is full of people talking about how we're going to change that. I've been working in games for over two decades, it has never changed. And in my lifetime, I doubt that games is suddenly going to become an easy 40 hour job. It's not like that. You're going to put 50, 60, 70, 80 hour weeks in. That's a thing in video games. The hours are going to be long. Um, that's a thing you have to get your head around. There are going to be a lot of people who want your job. 
And you're going to have to fight very hard to get a job in the industry. And you're going to have to fight very hard to keep your job in the industry because there is a constant flow of people that want to come in and take your job. And so that's going to be a thing you deal with your entire career. And that will never go away. And then this is the other thing you ought to know. You're going to get paid crap, right? You're going to get paid less than people doing the same job in a different industry. If you're a programmer in the game industry, you're gonna be earning about 20% less than what you would earn as a programmer in any other industry. If you're an artist in the industry, you're gonna be learning about 20% less. If you're a marketing person in the industry, 20% less. Across the board, you're going to earn less. And the reason you're gonna earn less is because everybody wants to do this job. And because everybody wants to do it, they can drop me you know, it's it's a it's a buyer's market for game companies who want to hire people that's a fact now i'm going to give you some tips in this video on how to overcome that and how to make all of this better but it's not going to go away that's all going to be stuff you deal with so hopefully i've already scared like half of the people watching this video away because honestly 90% of the people watching this video probably won't make it into the industry and probably won't survive if they get there uh, that's just a fact. And that's not me being morbid or dark. That's just them's the averages. So that's thing one that you need to know. So thing two, and I just want to get this out right at the very beginning, because I've heard this so many times. And, uh, there's so many people out there that are like, I have this great idea for video game. I just need a team to build it. Can you tell me how to do that? Um, yeah, I can actually, that's very easy. You need to be very wealthy. That's the, that's the quick answer. I mean, if you're, if you're fabulously wealthy and you can fund a video game, you are welcome to go have somebody build your video game for you. That's a thing you can do, but short of that. Yeah, probably not. And, and let me clarify why this is the case. Everybody has a good idea for a video game. Everyone who's ever played a video game has a good idea for a video game. Everyone who's been even vaguely interested in building video games is a good idea for a video game. And you know who really has a lot of good idea for video games? Guys who make video games, right? The, the folks that actually have jobs in video games have not just as many, but way more good ideas than you do. And unlike you, they have the skills to make video games and they have the connections to people that fund video games. They actually can make them. Um, and that's, what you're competing against if you're a person with an idea. So this whole, I have an idea for a video game, I just need, if you're a fabulously, if you're like a, an Arabian prince and you've got all of daddy's oil money and you just wanna go hire a video game company, uh, I happen to have a video game company, please hire me. But short of that, no, this is not a thing. Being a good video game developer is not about having a good idea for a game. It's about everything else that goes in the video game. So I just want to get that out right at the beginning. If that's a thing that you've got in your head, I'm sorry to be the person that has to break this to you, but that's not a thing. I know you think that's a thing. That's not a thing. So um, the next question, I get this a lot, is... Is there any money in games? I, I usually get this from concerned Asian parents. That's that's because I live in Asia. I deal with a lot of Asian folks. And I think there's a lot of people who still live in a world where they think like, there's not a lot of money in video games. Okay, let me be the person to explain to you. And I, I if, if you have a parent who's tried to explain to you there's no money in video games, I encourage you to show them this video because I'm going to bust that myth right now. Um, this is a list of mobile games right now. This I took this off Wikipedia. You can find this information or information like this all around the internet. Um, this is the top 25 only mobile games. This is not console games, not PC games. This isn't any, this is purely mobile games and how much money they have made. I would direct your attention to the top of that list where it says that Monster Strike has made $8.1 billion. Not million, billion with a B, right? Um, and that's one of the, if, if you were to add these 25, just these 25 games alone together, you're looking at, I don't know, well over $50 billion. Every one of these games is making crazy money, like crazy, crazy, crazy money. Right. And, and now I know some people are going to, going to be like, um, well, you know, some of that money has been paid back into user acquisition and blah, 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 blah. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Um, let me show you some of the biggest game franchises of all time. By far, the most popular, uh, successful by revenue game franchise of all time is Mario. Uh, Mario has a number of different games. Across all of the Mario games, lifetime revenue, something like $31.5 billion. Again, with a B, right? And that's 
just Mario. It's a Mario. That's $31 billion, right? Pokemon, another $18 billion. Call of Duty, another $18 billion. Uh, the, the Wii Sports, Wii Fit, the sort of Wii something franchise of games. Not all the games on Wii, but just the games that were titled Wii something. Uh, that's another $14 billion. Pac-Man, $14 billion. Space Invaders, $13 billion, right? These And these are just the top franchises. This is a a metric ton of money that's being put into the... And you're like, okay, well, you're picking the favorites or whatever. All right. This, I pulled this chart. I knew there's dozens of charts like this on the internet. You're welcome to go look. This is from Nuzu, which is a, a relatively well-known uh, metrics and data reporting company in the games industry. And this will tell you what the overall uh, market for games broken by mobile PC and console games is. $180 billion forecasted for 2021. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, like a whole lot of money, $12 billion or $180 billion. To put this in perspective, to kind of put your head around, because these are huge numbers. These are huge numbers that you can't even understand. Um, if you took every single television company, every single television production company, you took the entire television industry and put it all together. I'm sorry, I just hit the microphone. If you put all that together, that's less money than video games. If you take every movie that was made last year, put them all, put the gross receipts of every single movie, Hollywood, Bollywood, uh, Parasite, uh, crappy Japanese movies, all of it. You put it all in one big, huge mound that's still less money than video games. Okay, professional sports. That's that's huge, right? Your dad loves the NFL, right? You take the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, every American sport, and then add cricket and rugby and all of those other crappy sports they play in places that aren't America. You take all of it. You put the whole bunch of it together. Put it all, all that money that all of that earned. You put that all in a pile. You still have less money than video games. So yeah, we are by far the most profitable entertainment industry in the world. We make a lot of money, right? So that's, if anyone wants to tell you, oh, there's no money in video games, uh, bleh, excuse me, uh, bleh. so anyway, that's a thing. Um, I'll give you one more example, right? This is a list of the 10 largest tech companies anywhere in the world, right? Not games companies, tech companies, right? Um, Apple right now stands as the uh, largest company in the history of the earth, I believe, by terms of revenue. I believe we've never had a company as profitable as Apple ever in the history of the earth. Um, and by the way, that market value column here, that's in billions. So um, I don't even know what comes after. Is it trillions comes after billions? Anyway, the market value of Apple is $961 billion. Where does Apple get its money? Well, Apple gets most of its money from selling cell phones, right? Uh, mobile phones. Why do people buy mobile phones? Because of video games. Go look. It's all video games, right? Um, they could buy a third world country. Apple could buy a second world country right? Uh, uh, Oracle could buy a third world country. I think you undervalue, somebody in chat was saying that they could buy a third world country. I think they could buy, they could buy like France. Um, anyway, so Apple, $961 billion. Where do they make all their money? They make their money on mobile phones mostly, right? That's where the huge, and what sells mobile phones? Video games sell mobile phones, right? Every time anyone sells a, um, a mobile game on, uh, on Apple, Apple gets 30%. That's a thing. Apple is actually one of the largest game publishers in the world. Samsung Electronics, where do they make their money? Again, phones. Why are they selling phones? Because people play games on Android. Microsoft, where does their money come from? Well, people play games on PC. Xbox, one of the largest console makers in the world is Microsoft. Huge revenues. Alphabet, which is the company which owns Google. Where does Google earn its money? Well, Google earns its money from ads. What kind of ads does Google sell? Google sells ads for games. That's what a whole lot of the GAD industry for, for Google is, right? Um, and, and by the way, uh, Google also owns Android. Android being the Android app store. And what's the number one thing that sells off the Android app store? Video games, right? Intel, what do they make? Computer chips, where do those go? In computers, in consoles, in phones that play games. Right, IBM, I don't know, I'm not gonna make a case for IBM, but Facebook, where does Facebook make its money? Makes its money in ads. What kind of ads you ask? Game ads, I will tell you, right? Tencent Holdings, one of the, you've never heard of Tencent as a game company. Most people who aren't in the video game industry don't know about Tencent. Tencent is a massive, huge Chinese company. And what do they invest in? 
video game companies. They own a big hunk of Blizzard. They own a big hunk of Supercell. I forget what other companies. I could go look it up. But Tencent is one of the largest uh, game company owning companies in the world, right? So this isn't just 10 large video game companies. This is the 10 biggest tech companies in the world. Most of them make a huge share of their revenue from video games. Um, somebody mentioned in chat uh, that they also fully own Riot, which is uh, another video game company. So I think I've put that issue to bed. Yes, video games make a lot of money. Um, if anyone still in 2020 believes that that's not a case, by all means, show them the last three minutes of this video. So now I want to talk in detail about what careers are actually available in the video game industry. Um, you know, I'm going to start with, this is the big three. This is what people kind of know. When somebody says, I want to be a video, I want to be in video games. Usually in their head, they're thinking, I want to be a coder, a designer, or an artist, right? And I think sort of in that order. Um, I think most people, when they think I'm going to be a video game developer, the first thing that comes to their mind is, I guess I'm going to program computers and make video games. And that's actually a pretty reasonable thought. There are a lot of people in video games who are computer programmers, a great job in video games, a big part of what happens in video games. And I want to just kind of break down, here's some of the stuff you can do as a coder in the video game industry, right? You can be a technical director. You can be the person in charge of all the code in a video game industry, which is a sort of a, a job aspiration for most people. I think this is where a lot of people would like their career as a coder to end up in code is being the technical director of a video game company. That's that's a very reasonable dream. It's actually the job that my business partner, Alan Simonson has, and he seems happy in it. Um, lead programmer, the guy who's in charge of uh, all of the code in games. And I, I'm sorry, I keep saying guy. Um, doesn't have to be a guy. Uh, there's plenty of women working in games. And it is interesting to me, actually, I'll, a, a small aside while we're here in code, uh, to talk about this disparity, one thing about the video game industry is it is still largely dominated by men. That's a thing. It's not a great thing. It's not something we're happy with in the game industry, but it is a thing. If you walk into a video game company, you will see that there are more men than women. That's been the case. It's becoming less and less so over time, but specifically in code, that has been uh, a thing. It still remains a thing. And so even, even now I catch myself when I start talking about video game developers, I use the word guy and it's, it's a wrong thing to do. Um, but this is a thing. If you're going to work in the video game industry that you're going to have to deal with is that, um, that being said, I know a lot of great coders who are women and that's a thing. Um, so there's that. Um, but talking about other jobs that you could have in, uh, code, they're sort of broken down by what kind of code do you do and what kind of work do you do? Um, there's game code. Game code is the people that are actually writing the code that handles the sort of game logic of the game. So, you know, how do I, how do I know, um, uh, how many points to take away when the orc gets hit with a sword? How do I know when to show this pop-up? How do I know how to make this, uh, market transaction happen inside of the game when I'm buying and selling things in world of Warcraft, etc. All of that stuff that you kind of think of as if this were a board game, how would I make these board game mechanics work? That's what we call game code. Um, it's an important part of coding. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in coding that people don't think as much about. Uh, there's graphics code. You know, how do I actually show the stuff on the screen? And this is very math intensive. This is very difficult code. Uh, pays better. <laughs> um, but this is a huge part of video game. And, you know, a lot of questions of why is this game run fast or run slow, etc. is largely based on the graphics coders, the people who are doing the graphics code. There's AI. How do... The, how does the game understand what the player is doing and respond to what the player is doing in an intelligent manner? Um, whether that's having bots that run around and shoot you intelligently or having enemy in a strategy game that works against you intelligently. And there are people who spend their whole lives specialized on nothing but AI code. Some of my, um, some of my best friends do this job and it's a very intellectual, heady job. It, it, there's a lot of design involved in this. Uh, there's also network code, people who handle the code in the back of the, 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 the game that handle uh, speaking up and down to the network and connecting computers to each other and that sort of thing. Uh, there's a bunch of other kinds of codes that I haven't listed here. There's physics coders who do, uh, you know, when you shoot a, uh, a you know, throw a ball at something, how does it bounce and how does it move around? There's a whole lot of different sort of areas of code. And usually, if you're going to get into games and you're going to be a coder um, and you're going to work for a large company, over time, you're going to specialize in one of these kind of 
uh, varieties of code because it's going to be something you're good at, something that you're interested in. And you're largely going to keep getting those kind of coding jobs. And that's fine. Um, and one thing I, I'd like to point out, even though lead programmer and technical director are sort of at the top of this list, that's not necessarily where your job in game code has to go. Right? You can go into graphics code and become an incredible graphics coder, become a lead graphics coder, and never become the technical director because that's not you, managing people isn't the thing that you want to do. You just want to be writing amazing graphics code. And there's a wonderful career path for you. Now, I'm going to take a quick time out right here while I'm talking about code to just say these guys earn a lot of money. Um, these guys and gals earn a lot of money, I should say. Um, if you were going into video games and you wanted to make money in video games and you wanted to be sure of getting a job, this is probably where you would want to go. Uh, and, and it's because the work to get here is very difficult. To be a coder is very difficult. Um, you're going to have to study quite hard. Uh, it's a very difficult job. It's a very intense job. Because a lot of people don't want to do the work, whether it's they can't or it's not interesting to them, a lot of people who go into video games don't want to be coders. And because of that, the coders earn more money, they have more job security. If you were to pick a job in the game industry that was gonna pay well and you weren't gonna get laid off as often, this is it, right? And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But the next thing I wanna talk about is design. And this is, um, when you ask what is a game design, a lot of people I think misunderstand game design and they think, well, the game designers are the ones who make up everything. Well, sorta, of. that's part of the job. Um, Think of game designers as product designers in the same way that somebody's got to figure out what the car looks like at an at a auto parts company. Someone has to figure out what the games look like. This is what designers do. And some of it is very obvious. You know, I'm going to make, and, and you think, oh, I, somebody made, let's say, World of Warcraft. And they said, oh, I'm going to make a game. It's going to have thousands of players all around the world. And they're going to play orcs and hobbits. And well, I guess there's no hobbits in World of Warcraft. They're going to play orcs and elves and whatever. And all of that sort of fun, creative stuff, that's part of being a designer. But the bigger part of being a designer is figuring out how all of that works, figuring out how all the systems that create all that work. Okay, when you hit somebody with your sword, how much damage does it do? When you go buy something, how much does that thing cost? When you want to do something, what does the user interface for that look like? What panels come up? What things do I click on? When the this one unit hits this one unit and you try to use this rule set, but that rule set conflicts with this other rule set, how do you resolve that conflict, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the time that you're spent being a designer is in sorting out these issues. And a lot of the time is spent actually in scripting languages, very esoteric looking scripting languages, figuring out how to make all of that happen given some kind of scripting language or editor that the coders have given you. A lot of time, for instance, for designers is spent uh, building levels or, or you know, laying out maps and that sort of thing. So let me walk through a couple of the sort of jobs that you get as a designer, sort of the, the top of the totem pole. And this happens to be my job at BoomZap. I'm a creative director. Um, I got to this job as a creative director. Uh, I began my life actually as a level designer at a small company that did 3d games and i actually sat with a piece of graph paper and a pencil and drew out levels with my graph paper and pencil and figured out how i was going to walk around these levels and then i sat with a calculator and added this is uh, many many years ago back in the world of dos and i sat in dos and typed in where the that was how what i did um and i worked from that role into being a lead designer which is somebody who sort of overall looks at the design of a product and tells people okay this is how we're going to build the game and here's the characters they're going to do this etc cetera, etc cetera. i have spent a great deal of time as a writer that is a huge part of being a game designer uh writing script what do the characters say how do the characters interact how do i explain to the player what to do how do i build tutorials that writing job is a big part of being a designer and in smaller companies a lot of this kind of gets shoved into designer. In BoomZap, for instance, we don't have specific systems designers or level designers or writers. I have designers that do all of those things. Um, that's how it works in a smaller company. In larger companies, you will specialize out and there are people who are writers and they do nothing but write game text. That's a thing that you can do in the world of design. There are people who are systems designers who only look at how does this game system work 
how does this combat system work? How does this economic system within the game work? And they design that all out. It's very similar to the sort of job you might have if you were a board game designer. Uh, that's a real thing in the game industry. There are people who are purely level or quest designers. If you are somebody who plays World of Warcraft and you go on a quest, there's somebody whose job it is just to write those quests, just to figure out how to use all of the parts of the game, put them all together into a level or a quest or whatever the sort of coherent small parts of the game are. That's design. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is art. And this is a huge, huge part of the game industry. And there's a lot of jobs you can do as an artist. And sort of just starting from the top, there's sort of a breakdown of artist versus animator. And some people will call them both art jobs. Some people will put them in totally different categories. The big difference between an artist and an animator is animators animate. Animators make things move around on the screen, whereas artists make static art. And these two people work together very closely. Uh, to build, for instance, a model in a game, you have a 3D artist, the 3D modeler will put together the 3D modeler. Well, what does he model? Well, the 3D modeler puts that 3D model together based off of concept art that some other artist did. So somebody's actually just drawing vehicles or drawing objects or drawing characters. Um, sometimes they're drawing environments. This is what I want the level to look like. And here's where the trees will go. And here's where the, the houses will go, etc. And they draw all that out. And then a 3D artist gets into the 3D art program like Max or Maya and actually models all that out. Then somebody else may get in or maybe the same person will get in and put textures on all of those surfaces so that it looks like the picture that they were given in the concept. Now there's things in that, that world that are going to move around, characters that are going to run around, fountains that are going to spray. Okay, well, there's effects artists who actually put together the particle systems for the fountain that goes up. There are uh, animators who figure out how to make that little dragon character run around and make their legs move around. But before the animator gets a hold of it, somebody's actually got to go into that 3D model and say, where are the bones inside of this character? And how is it going to move? What are going to be the limitations for how that thing can move around and put those points in? That person is called a rigger and they actually rig the model. And there's actually, a, and, and as you get to larger companies, these all become separate individual people. There are people at Ubisoft right now that do nothing but take a 3D model and put bones in it and rig it and get it all ready for an animator to animate. They don't animate, they don't model, they're the step in between that. And all of those are, depending on the size of the company that you're in, those all might be one job, they might be a number of jobs spread around a number of people, depends on the size of the company. All of these jobs are highly technical. They involve using products like Photoshop or 3D Max or Maya or Blender or any of a number of other uh, art tools. And those are highly technical things that you have to learn. Um, but they also involve art and they involve actually knowing how to draw, knowing art skills like composition and uh, how to you know put a scene together and, and how color theory works, et cetera, et cetera. So that's art, and that's the sort of things that you can do in art. And I would say if you're looking at a video game studio, this is the majority of the people in a video game development studio. Now, there are other jobs, and we're going to talk about those in a second, but these are sort of the big three. When people think about going into video game development, they're usually talking about one of these three things, and these are sort of a breakdown of a number of the jobs that you can do in a video game studio in, in what people kind of know about video games. I want to take you a little deeper and I want to talk about a bunch of jobs that actually don't get talked about in the video game industry. And I want to start with these three sort of large categories of games. Uh, production and QA. Um, there are producers who are the people sort of in charge of projects, who manage the schedules of projects, et cetera, et cetera. And there's QA, the testers and the people that test games, right? Sound, the people who make sound for games. And localization, the people who make games in other languages. Let's walk through these in a little bit more detail. Now, production and QA, there's obviously uh, producers. There's assistant producers, which will always be referred to as ass prods um, because we, we like to call them that because they're sort of the, the low person on the totem pole in most game development studios. Um, 
There are, and, and those are, you know, a producer is the, the sort of person who's going to, you know, go and look at schedules and go and make sure you've got enough people working on a certain task. Do we have enough artists doing this? When is this thing going to be done? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, assistant producers are people who help them in that role. But there's other jobs as well in production. One of the big jobs that people don't know about is asset managers. When you're putting together a great, big, huge project, uh, there's a lot of assets involved. I just talked about all those art assets, all of those models, all of those textures, all of that code, all of that data, all of those levels, all of that stuff in larger studios, that, that can be a lot of stuff. And figuring out how to store all that stuff, how to manage all that stuff, how to let this person know that that stuff exists, how to make sure that that stuff is all made correctly, it's the right file size, it's in the right file locations, etc. That's a job. And in large studios, that's a relatively important job. Uh, in, in a studio like Blizzard has many, many asset managers that handle just that thing, right? There's also operations and system admin type jobs. Uh, these are people who make sure that the, you know, the servers work and make sure that the, the, you know, the computers on everybody's desk work. The people who make sure that, you know, everything in the studio is actually operational. Make sure that all the products that we need to make our game exist. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, and somebody over in, in chat right now is saying, and this is very true, is a producer that it's quite different from a producer in a movie. So more often than not, in games, producers lean more towards project management rather than actually having uh, a real effect on the creative side. And that's true. Um, because games have designers and lead designers and creative directors, we already have a lot of people with opinions about how things ought to be. And that doesn't even count the artists and the other people who are also having creative opinions about what to be. A lot of times producers are encouraged to keep their goddamn opinions to themselves and to spend most of their time worrying about do we have the assets that we need, do we have the money that we need, do we have the time that we need. And a big part of working as a producer in a game dev studio is working with a publisher and interacting with the people who are actually paying for the management of the game. And in many cases, uh, the game is actually being published by an, another company who's paying for that, who's going to be distributing it. And somebody's interacting with that company. That's a huge part of the producer's role. Now, and this is another part of uh, game development that doesn't get nearly enough credit, and it's a huge part of game development, is QA and QA management, right? I will tell you flat out right now, nobody will destroy an independent game dev studio faster than a crappy QA manager, right? When you've played a game and that game was full of bugs and it wasn't very fun and stuff didn't work right, I will tell you, you either had a crappy QA manager or you had a studio that didn't listen to their QA manager. One of those two things is true, right? Way we make good games that aren't full of bugs, we test them. And at the bottom of that sort of totem pole are the testers. And this is the official, my first entry into video games job. And we're going to talk more about this later. But one of the easiest ways to get into video games is testers because we need a lot of them and it's hard, thankless work. And I know a lot of people are like, game testing? Hard? It's playing games for a living. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> being a games tester is playing games that are broken for a living. And that's a very different thing than playing games for a living. I know you love video games and you love playing video games. How much do you like playing video games that are broken, that aren't fun yet, that are full of bugs, and that you have to play for like eight hours a day whether or not you're enjoying it? That's the job of a game tester. Now, um, there's also another important job sort of in the, the world of production and QA that's community managers. These are people who manage the community of games as games have become larger, have uh, sort of large uh, multiplayer components uh, as we've had social media and people talking on social media and discord and Facebook and all of that. Um, and especially as we've had games that have in-game chat and people that can talk to each other in-game and put together. All of that means that people are interacting. And when people interact, sometimes they don't get along. And when they don't get along, somebody in that process has to come in and say, hey, you know, quit using the F word in front of the children. And somebody's got to say, oh, you're breaking the rules of the game. And somebody's got to say, oh, it looks like this part of the game's not fun. And a lot of people aren't enjoying this part of the game. And I need to go, even though it's not broken, even though it's all working exactly as designed, the people don't like it. And they're complaining about it in the metagame. And somebody's got to go tell the producer about that so that the producer can go talk to the creative director and say, look, this thing is not fun and people don't like it and we need to fix it. That's the role of the community manager. Again, in a very large, uh, in a game that has a large audience, a game can be destroyed by having a crappy community manager and not having good community managers. This whole sort of production QA thing, 
I don't think gets enough credit in video games as being a critical part of the failure or the success of video game companies. And it's a, it's a valid career path for people that want to go into games. Sound. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sound. Um, I'll be honest, this is probably the part of the game industry that I know the least. Um, and so I want to be a little bit careful about talking about sound. And so before I did this, I actually went and talked to a couple friends of mine who are really good at sound stuff. They're professional sound people. They've been in the game for decades and they, they know sound. And I asked them about getting into uh, the world of sound. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. I'm going to have a whole section at the end of this where I go through and talk about how to get in. And I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that when we get to it. But right now, I want to say there's kind of three basic things that you can do in sound. You can be the guy in charge of sound. You can be the person who does the sound effects, which is, you know, all the sounds that you hear in a game. Or you can be the person that makes the music, right? That's most of the sound in games, right? They're either an effect or they're music. Now, um, in small studios, that tends to be the same person because there's really not, uh, it's hard to, I have a great big, huge sound department in a small game company. And so a lot of times there's one person who's the sound person. They do both of those things. Obviously in larger studios, uh, this can be a, a very large department with people who are musicians or people who are sound effects artists, people who record sound effects. A lot of times this is actually one of the parts of the games that we outsource a lot. So a lot of times the people who work in sound aren't working in a game dev studio. They're working in a sound studio and that sound studio is hired to do sound work for companies. And actually I should mention, uh, this is also true more and more lately for art, that a lot of people who work in art don't actually work in game studios. They work in big art studios where they just are given tasks by game dev studios to do animation or to do art. And that's a very valid way to be in the game industry as well. The last thing I want to talk about is localization. Um, in case you weren't aware, other countries play video games too. And those countries like to play those video games in their language. And they like to play those video games following the laws of the country that they are being played in. For instance, in some countries you can't show blood. In some countries you can't show a swastika. In some countries uh, uh, being uh, unclothed is illegal. There's all kinds of rules. And not just law, there's also culture. Some countries, the people don't like this, or they like this better, or they like this kind of thing better. And so uh, localization is not just about translating the game into another language. It's about translating the story, about translating the overall look and feel of the game into what is going to do best for the people that you're, you're, you're shipping the game to. And in many cases, uh, that also includes the business relationship that you have with them. How are they going to buy the game? How are they going to pay for the game? Some countries don't have credit cards or, or don't have a lot of credit cards. Some countries prefer to pay for their games through Steam. Uh, some, game, some countries, uh, Google is not legal. These are all things that you have to deal with when you're dealing with localizing your game for different regions of the world. And there are people who specialize in this. I'll note this is another place that gets outsourced a lot. There are companies that are specialized in doing globalization and localization. And often they get hired to do this for a company. So a lot of times you'll be working for a localization company and not for the actual company. In larger companies, say Ubisoft or Electronic Arts, obviously they have in-house localization people as well. And this goes all the way from being a tester of localization, being somebody who's, you know, I'm, I understand French and I understand how French games ought to be. I'm going to check your French game and make sure it all is properly French uh, to being the translator, the person that actually, you know, writes all the Brazilian Portuguese script for the game and make sure it's all there or being the person that manages all that thing happening and, you know, talks to the te creative team and makes the changes that need to happen. That's all a job as well. Now you're like, whoa, that's a lot of jobs, Chris. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not done yet. We haven't even talked about marketing and business. And these are two parts of the game industry. A lot of people are like, I love games. I want to be involved in games, but I don't know anything about code and I don't know it. I'm not an artist. There's plenty of other jobs working in video games that don't get talked about very much. Right now, and we'll start with marketing. I would say right now, the success of a video game in the app store is about 50% 
the way the game was built, the way the game was designed, the stuff that the people we just talked about did, and about 50% marketing. How that game has been exposed to an audience, how we have done marketing assets for it, how we've gotten people to play it on live streams, et cetera, et cetera. A huge, huge part of how games get sold and whether or not games are successful comes from marketing. And these are real skills. This isn't just like, oh yeah, yeah, we, we you know, we, we made some banner ads, you know, there's real skills to being a marketer. There's, and if you go to a major publisher, you go to Electronic Arts or Ubisoft or somebody that works with independent developers, this is actually their big value add. This is actually where they come in and do a lot of work. If, if I have a game and I say, I want Paradox to publish my game, the number one thing I'm interested in is not Paradox's coders or their artists or their sound department. I'm interested in their marketing department. I'm interested in how is Paradox gonna go out and actually sell copies of my game. This is a huge, huge part of the game industry. And it has a couple different jobs. There's obviously people who handle marketing and advertising. Um, but then there's another role that I think a lot of people don't even know about that is a huge role in the game industry, which is data analysts. Now, you take a mobile game, a mobile free-to-play game, and you put it out in the market, and that game does how well? How do you know? How do you know if it's doing well or if it's doing poorly? Well, how much money did it make? Well... There's a lot deeper you can look into the game than how much money did it make. You can look into when did people start playing it? How many people dropped out in level one? How many people dropped out in level four? How many people were still playing the game after seven days? If we added this feature, did more people or less people play the game? If we changed this value here and we made this level more difficult, were more people happy or were less people happy? Answering all of these questions is an art. It's an actual science that is, it is art and a science, that is handled by data analysts. And that's a real job. It's a very important job in the industry right now. And if you wanted to go get a job and get paid well in the game industry right now, this is actually a really interesting part of the game industry for people to get into. And it's something I think a lot of people who don't know much about the game industry, they're not even aware that that role exists. But that's a huge part of what publishers do. And these are people that are going to work at big companies like Tencent or uh, Supercell or Riot, which, you know, jokes on you, those are all 10 cent. Haha. <laughs> anyway, that being said, there's also a whole nother business section of video games. You remember at the beginning of this talk, I talked about the fact that these are companies that are doing revenues of many, many billions of dollars, in some cases, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, that's big business. And somebody's got to go do that business and do all the business roles there. Uh, there's licensing games. When you looked at how much money did Mario make, that was just the money that Mario had made in video games. We didn't even touch how much money did Mario make on little Mario hats and little Mario plush dolls or Pokemon made on little Pokemon plush dolls or how much money was made off of uh, uh, Star Wars rides at the, at the uh, amusement park, etc., etc. There are so many different things that get licensed in video games. And there's people who manage just that process, right? There's legal. Every single game that ever got made has a contract, right? Whether it was the contract between the developer and the distribution network. You know, I signed a sign when, when we put uh, Last Regiment on Steam, we had to sign a contract with Steam. Lawyers wrote that. When we made Awakening with Big Fish Games, which was our publisher, we signed a contract with Big Fish Games. Lawyers made that. Lawyers on their side, lawyers on our side. And there are people who deal with those lawyers and there are people who are those lawyers. I will tell you, if you're interested in video games and you want a career as a lawyer, that's a high paying job right there. Nothing to do with making video games, but very much a part of the game industry. Finance. Again, billions of dollars. You heard the whole billions of dollars. Um, how do you structure that money? Where do you put that money? How do I pay that money out? Where does it come in? Where did I structure my companies? Where did... There's... When you're talking about this much money, there's a lot of finance that gets done. You look at just one franchise. You look at the, the, the Medal of Honor franchise, for instance. That franchise alone makes as much money as like the Dallas Cowboys. Probably a hell of a lot more. I promise you the Dallas Cowboys has a, you know, a finance department that figures all that out. And you know what? EA has a finance department that figures all that out too. It's a huge part of the game industry. 
HR and studio management. Somebody's got to hire these people, fire these people, make sure that they get paid on time, make sure they got health insurance and blah, blah, blah. All the crap that comes with running a business, games industry's got all of that. And I know a lot of people say, I want to be in games. And I always hear them talk about those first three. I always hear them talk about getting into art or design or code. And that's great. That's what that's a big part of what we do. You got, someone's got to make the games. But there's all of these other roles in the game industry. And I think these don't get enough airtime in, you know, when parents are talking about my son loves video games and, you know, I want to make sure that he has a good job when he graduates college. These are all video game jobs. And quite honestly, some of these marketing and business jobs, they pay pretty well. Um, so that's something to think about. All right. So that's all the jobs in games. Where do I get rich? Well, here. Um, this is not the final answer to these questions. Um, I've always wanted to be an accountant for the game industry. I know that sounds weird over in chat. People are like, I don't know if that's, is that really a game industry job? Yes, being an accountant in the game industry is a real job. I have friends, you know, I, I, I go back to that. Um, I used to work at a company called Kodiak. And one of my favorite people at Kodiak was a guy named John Slager. And John Slager was the legal and finance and accounting guy for Kodiak. And he, he, before he worked at Kodiak, he worked in real estate. He was like, a, a, I don't know what he did in real estate, but he had a real estate job. But you know what? He loved to play video games. And when we all sat down at the studio and played LAN games and had a good time, John Slager was there playing LAN games with us. He didn't know how to make games. He didn't know how to design games. But he was in the game industry. He got to go into a game studio every day, got to hang out with game people. And he still got to make a bunch of money being a finance dude. So, you know, laugh all you want. It's a real job. All right, so where do I get rich? Um, here's just a couple jobs that I pulled off the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. These are US numbers, these are median salaries. Um, I know I showed you a bunch of other jobs and they're not all listed here. Sorry about that. Um, I do wanna point out, look, software developer right there at the top earning a good solid, what, 30% more than anybody else. Like I said, if you want to get into the games industry and you want to make money and you want to have a job and you want to develop games, learn how to code, right? That's the, the that's where you're going to make money. And you know what this doesn't touch on is how often do these people get laid off? And I will tell you the last people a game studio lays off is its programmers because the good programmers are actually hard to find. Um, so you want to make money? Go in the code. Multimedia artists and animators? You can see they make good money. $72,000 a year isn't a bad money. And keep in mind, these are not starting salaries. These are median salaries, including people who've been doing this a very long time. Um, you could probably cut all of these salaries a little, about in half for where you're going to start in the game industry. Uh, if you started today as a software developer, you're probably looking at fifty dollars to $60,000. If you started today as an animator, you're probably looking at $35,000, $40,000. That's where these jobs start in America. Now, you can take that same money and translate it. I can promise you ain't nobody paying $100,000 in Manila for software developers. That's not a thing. And I know the Filipinos watching this are like, dude, I'm so underpaid. Not in Manila, you're not. Um, so so that's a thing. So you have to, these, these are U.S. labor statistics. And these are all whacked way out of proportion because they include a lot of very expensive cities. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but a number of the places where a lot of video game developers work, Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, London. And these are not cheap places to live. So to make sure that these people can survive in those kind of big game cities, they earn inflated salaries, but you know what? They're paying crazy costs to live in those four cities. And so these these numbers are a little bit out of whack. but. If your mom is always, you know, telling you there's no money for you in video games. All right, here's another thing. Look, mom, you can make good money making video games, right? Um, so those are, uh, and when it says software developer, that's not just software. This is actually in the games industry. So that's how much money you can make. All right, you want my real advice? You want me to actually tell you what you should do? So this is my 30 second. I probably should have put this at the very beginning of the video. Somebody says, I want to get in video games. What should I do? Here, let me lay it out for you as clean and simple as I can. My real advice, go to a four-year college, get a degree in computer science, study graphics, make sure that you understand math while you're in school, build video games. When you graduate, have a portfolio of games that you programmed, really simple, easy games that you programmed. Go get a job as a software developer. That's my, that's my honest to God advice. 
Now, what's funny is over in chat, there's a guy named Javi who's saying, hey, that's what I did. Javi has a computer science degree. Guess what? Javi's not a programmer. Javi's one of our designers, right? Um, Shutter Sky, who is, who is actually our marketing manager, also has a degree in CS, right? Just because you have a degree in computer science doesn't mean that you have to be a programmer in the game industry, but it means you know how to program in the game industry, which means you know how to talk to programmers. It means you know how to work with programmers. And it means that if you have to, you can program, which is going to make you a much better candidate for almost any role in software development, right? That's my honest, if you want to, um, if you want to get into games, that's honestly where I would suggest you go. And I know a lot of you are like, but I want to do sound. I want to do art. Okay, hang in there. Hang in there. This is just my my generic, basic um, advice. I'm now going to go into a great deal of detail into how to get a job in every category of video games. And we're going to talk about that in detail. So let's start with what I just talked about. How do you break into the game industry as a programmer? How do you become a programmer in the game industry? Uh, my real advice, go to a four-year college to get a degree in computer science. This is as straightforward as it gets, right? This is, the, this, is a, this is a no-brainer, right? And a lot of people are like, wow, four-year college is really expensive. I get it. It is, right? I would actually suggest, and I will tell you the exact advice that I am giving my son who's 13 years old right now who wants to be a game programmer, right? And he doesn't, he doesn't say he wants to be a game programmer. He says he wants to be in the game industry. So I will tell you the actual advice I'm giving my son, which is go to two years worth of community college, right? First two years of college, doesn't matter where the hell you go to college. It's all the same, right? Learn how to code, focus on math. After two years, transfer to any school that you can afford. It doesn't matter, right? You don't have to go to Harvard. You don't have to go to Yale. You don't have to go into some special game program. Any school that teaches computer science. Do you know why? Because you have the internet, dummy, right? Anything you could possibly want to know about game development, anything you possibly want to know about programming, the internet will have it. And in point of fact, you don't actually need the degree. Objectively, you could sit at home and learn to program all on your own. I will say, being in a structured program makes that faster and easier and keeps you honest about what you're learning. And having a piece of paper at the end that you can wave in front of employers and say, look, I had the wherewithal and the gumption to sit through this many years of computer science programming classes. That's worth something. And I would suggest it highly. But the actual work that you need to do to become a games programmer is make games. I'll say that again. Make games, right? Right now you're in high school and you're like, I want to be a games programmer someday. Then make games. There's Unity. There's JavaScript. There's Flash. I don't know if there's Flash anymore, but there's a whole bunch of different things that you can use that you can get into relatively quickly that all the instructions of how to do it are right there on the internet. If you want to take, if you are 16 years old right now and you're thinking about being a game programmer, all of the computer science programming classes that they teach at Harvard, they're online right now and 20 other schools for free. You don't have to go to Harvard. You can take Harvard classes. You can learn everything that they, you can watch the professors tell you exactly what they're going to tell you. Go buy the exact same books. You can do the exact same exercises. You can go get yourself a Harvard level computer science education right now. You don't have to wait, right? Sure. Go to college, do the thing, but why wait? Do that thing right now. You can start literally right now, right? But I want to make games. Great. Make games, right? There's, there's, Unity is right there waiting for you to learn it. And as soon as you learn the basic skills of Unity, you can start putting together little tiny games. And I strongly suggest start with little tiny games. Don't don't make big games. Make little tiny games. Uh, make little tiny games that you can finish. And make a lot of them. Make my first game. Go out, look on the web, and find a little web game that you like. And just rebuild it. Don't worry about, is it original? Is it going to sell? Is it going to make money? Nobody cares right now. You're just learning how to make a video game. Go go look at, you know, a lot of game programmers. I believe Alan's first game was Tic-Tac-Toe, right? Nobody needs another Tic-Tac-Toe game. You need to learn how to make games. And Tic-Tac-Toe will get you started. So will a Match 3 game. So will uh, uh, Copy and Drop 7 or something like that. These are all things that you could do right now, right? When you graduate from your four-year college, um, you now have a computer science degree, which as a special bonus, if you decide you don't want to do games, 
You don't have to do games because you have a computer science degree. You can go get a job anywhere with one of those, right? Um, and you have a little portfolio of games and you can walk into a game company and say, I really want to be a game programmer. I have a computer science degree and I spent the last four years or six years or however long you spent making video games. Here's my little library of games that I made. I'd like to make games for you. You know what? I'm going to I'm gonna hire that guy, right? I've, I've hired literally hundreds of people in the game industry. I've interviewed thousands of people. That's the interview I want. I want a guy to walk in. I want, I, I want her to have a, a, a resume that says, I actually had the gumption to go through four years of college and I got a computer science degree, even though it was hard and I know how to do math, right? Oh, and here I made these games. That's, that's the person I want to hire, right? That's it. Really straightforward. So how about a designer? How to break in as a designer? How do I break into the game industry as a designer? I don't want to be programmer. I want to be as a designer. My real advice, go to a four-year college, get a degree in computer science. That's my honest advice for designers as well. And you're like, but I don't want to be a programmer. I want to be a designer. Great. You know what the best way to be a designer is? Be able to make your own game. I have a great idea for a game. I want to make this cool app. If you're a designer that doesn't know how to program, you're going to have to go find a programmer and get them to program your game for you. But you know what? That programmer also wants to make a game. He doesn't want to make your game. She wants to make her game. And so you're going to have that fight right? You want to make your game? Go learn to code. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. Now, if you are like, I don't know, I've tried, I don't understand math. I don't, I'm not really good at uh, code. All right. Um, I'll, I'll take one step back, right? Go build some levels. That's a thing. There's 20 games out there that have level editors or some kind of editor or some mod editor uh, that will allow you to go in and make a new mod of uh, RimWorld or to make levels for Unreal or to make, hey, strategy game levels for Last Regiment. My game has an editor, right? Go to any game that has one of these editors and start building levels, start building things because this is what your job will be if you get into the game industry. Your job is not going to be to sit in an easy chair and point at things and say, oh, I have a dream. It's going to be World of Warcraft, but it's going to be science fiction. Go, my minions, and make my game. That's not how this shit works. If you get a job as a real live designer in a real live game studio, they're going to hand you an editor and they're going to say, make some shit, dude. And you're going to have to make some stuff. And if you have spent the last few years doing that in various kinds of editors, you will know how to do that. And when you go for your job interview to be a game designer and they say, well, you want to be a designer, what do you have to show me? Well, look, I built all these Unreal levels. Aren't they fun and interesting? And look, I put them up in the community and the community voted my Unreal levels. And you think that's a weird story. That's exactly how I hired one of the designers when I worked at Crytek on Far Cry. We had a, a, a guy, Ben Bauer was his name, a really great designer named Ben. He was a German dude. And he had built, I want to say it was Unreal. I don't remember what. He had built a whole bunch of levels and he was a famous level designer. And he had done that with no education, no specific game development education or anything like that. He'd gone and learned how to build levels. And he built great 3D levels. He put them up in the community. People played his levels. They complained about his levels. He fixed them. He made them better. And he was a great level builder. And he came to our studio and said, I want to build levels for your game studio. And we said, well, how do you know where you're good? Well, look, here's literally hundreds of thousands of people who've played my games and they think my games are good. Don't you want me to work for you? And we were like, yeah, yeah, you have a job. Done, right? And there's literally nothing stopping you from doing that. And I don't know how many times I've had somebody apply for a job as a designer and I say, okay, well, where's your games? And they're like, well, I, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna work for you and I was gonna make games with you. And I'm like, well, what the hell have you been doing? If you're a serious game designer, okay, fine. You don't want to use a level editor. Where's your board game? Where's the world that you built for your D&D &D campaign? Where's your card game that you designed? If you're a game designer, if you're serious about being a game designer, you've got a game somewhere. Show me that game. And so how do you break in as a game designer? Again, my real advice, go get a four-year computer science degree. And while you're getting your four-year computer science degree, spend your time building levels. Spend your time using editors. Spend your time designing a huge world for your D&D &D campaign. Become a dungeon master and learn what it's like to run a campaign and how to make things that people enjoy in a campaign. Uh, get involved in some way so that when you show up after you graduate from college, you're not just some 
person with a with a degree. You're a person with some games to show me. Um, now, if you really hate computer science and you really don't want to do computer science, I get it. I don't have a degree in computer science. My degree is actually in Asian history. Um, I know I'm not proud, but I have a, I have a graduate degree in business. Um, that's okay. I was, I got in the industry, uh, quite a long time ago and I got in the industry. I'll tell you my, my, how I broke in as a game designer. I was a dungeon master and my D and D role-playing group, uh, were a bunch of people that worked for a game studio called, uh, origin. They were the guys that made, uh, the particular group of people that I played Dungeons and Dragons with were the core team behind a game called Privateer. And we used to go to Origin, a game dev studio, and sit in their conference room at night and play Dungeons and Dragons. And I was their dungeon master. And when a bunch of them broke off of that studio to go start their own independent studio, uh, it was a studio called, uh, what was it, uh, Maelstrom Games. And they said, hey, Chris, you know how to, you know, you're a tech guy. And at the time, I was actually a, a, a designer for theater. And they knew that I knew how to use AutoCAD, which was what we used to make theater designs. And they said, AutoCAD's not so different from 3D Max, which is what we use to build models. And you're a pretty good DM and a pretty good designer. Why don't you come and be a level designer for us? And that's how I broke into the game industry. And it was a long time ago, so things were a little bit different back then. But the basic nuts and bolts of... I was a technical person who understood how to use a tool that they needed to have used. And I had experience as a designer and I knew how to design things. That thing was true. And you need to have that same uh, sort of situation. The nepotism, by the way, doesn't hurt. So that's how to break in as a designer. How about an artist? I want to be an artist. <sighs> My real advice, go to a four-year college, get a degree in computer science. Um, that's, that's, uh, that, uh, that's not entirely true. Um, what I would honestly suggest about being an artist, however old you are, I don't care if you're five years old or 15 years old or 35 years old, if you want to be an artist, the number one thing that you need to do is you need to draw a lot. And this isn't, you don't have to, people are like, oh, I need to know which Photoshop version to use or what art program. You need to learn how to draw. Get a pencil, learn form, learn composition, learn traditional art. I can teach a monkey how to use Photoshop. It's just software. I can teach anybody how to use 3D Max. I can't teach them how to be a good artist. That's something that takes years and years and years to develop. Learning how to use colors together, learning how to use line, learning how to compose an image, learning how to close your eyes and see something in your head and then use your body to make that thing actually appear. That is an incredible skill and that is a skill that takes decades to develop. And it is never too early to start that. Uh, from the time you are, I mean, most people I know who are successful game artists, they knew they were going to be an artist from the time they were very young. They started when they were five or six years old. They were the kid in class that drew all the time. Uh, they always drew little things on their books. They always had a sketch pad with them. They were always drawing. Those are the people who become successful artists. That's my number one suggestion. You should be drawing a lot. Okay, now it's time to go to college. What should I do if I want to be a professional game artist? Go to a four-year college, get a degree in computer science. Draw while you're there. Um, I say that because it's just really easy to get a job as a computer scientist. That's just a, If you have a CS degree, it's so easy to get work. And if you're an artist, it's actually quite difficult to get work. And having a CS degree and knowing how to program is a wonderful fallback job. That being said... If you're dedicated, dedicated, dedicated to a life in art and making art, then by all means, go to a four-year school, get a BFA in visual arts. That's not a bad degree. I would strongly suggest against going to some specialized uh, game university. Uh, some of those are really creepy and squirrely. You don't need to do that. You don't need to go to Donkey Kong University if you want to work in video games. By all means, go to a normal two-year community college. After your two years of community college, go to two years. Any state school will do you just fine. Major in fine arts. Take a bunch of drawing classes. Learn about art. Um, I Somebody in chat says, and it's true, um, if you go into multimedia arts or into advertising, again, you've got some great fallback skills. If Remember, at the beginning of this lecture, most people don't survive in games. Most people don't stay in games. And so... If somebody comes to me 
and they have a degree in multimedia arts or in advertising and they have an incredible art portfolio i don't give a crap what their degree was in right um i'm going to hire them based on their portfolio and so having that degree in advertising in marketing and we're going to talk in a minute about marketing marketing is a wonderful job and there's a lot of money to be made in marketing right and having that to fall back on that's a wonderful fallback career so i would say going to uh going to school getting a bfa in fine arts getting a degree in advertising getting a degree in mixed media arts or getting a four-year degree in computer science um, any one of those is a very valid way to get in as an artist because when I'm going to interview you and see whether or not I want to hire you as an artist, there is one thing that will be 90% of my decision and that is your portfolio. That's a fact, right? And so whatever it is you're doing in college, whatever you're studying doesn't really matter. What really matters is, are you improving as an artist? And here's the good news. You live in 2020 where there's an internet and the internet has everything you could possibly want to become an incredible artist. There are websites out there like DeviantArt that have huge art communities where people are, are opening up Photoshop and literally showing you step by step, here's how I drew this character, here's how I modeled this, here's everything you could possibly want to know about being an artist. The internet has all of it. Thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of videos and tutorials and communities that you can go join that will look at your art and that will give you suggestions. And when you want to break in as an artist, the again, 90% of my decision, easily 90%, is going to be, I'm going to look at your portfolio and I'm going to see, are you a good artist, right? And that's not going to come from going to Harvard or you know, some fancy game dev school or anything like that. That's going to come from you at a desk with a pencil drawing, you with a Wacom tablet and you're drawing and you're learning Photoshop, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter what program you use. You being a good artist is the only thing that actually matters. And everything you could want to know about being a good artist, the internet has all of that there. And you should be part of an art community. You should be making art every single day. You should be posting your art to an online site that other people can see. You should be getting feedback and criticism on your art. You should be taking that art and using that criticism to improve that art. You should be looking at art tutorials, all of that. If you do all of that, I don't care what degree you got in college. Study whatever the hell you want. You graduate college, you got any degree at all, you've got that portfolio. Honestly, you didn't even graduate college. If you've got that portfolio, you've got a chance to get a job as an artist. Now, a question I get a lot about this that people ask me like, what art program should I learn? It doesn't really matter, right? The industry standard, we use Photoshop, Max, Maya, those are the three bigs, right? If, if you wanted to learn a program, those are three great programs to learn. But there's 20 different Photoshop-like programs that are free or damn near free that work pretty much exactly like Photoshop. And if you know how to use any of them, you'll learn how to use Photoshop in a couple weeks. Uh, there's plenty of 3D art programs that don't cost what Max or Maya cost that use pretty much the same basic ideas and the same basic tools. If you learn any one of those, you'll learn Max or Maya pretty quickly and you won't have to spend a whole bunch of money. Uh, none of this requires an incredibly good computer, but if you're going to be a computer artist, yeah, maybe don't go to Starbucks so often, save some money and buy a halfway decent computer. You're probably putting together a reasonably decent machine. You're probably wanting to buy a tablet. And that's probably, if you were going to invest in something, that wouldn't be a bad investment for you. Uh, but for software, whatever, doesn't matter. It's all going to change in a couple years anyway, right? They're going to make a new version of Photoshop and they're going to change where all the tools are and you have to relearn the whole damn thing anyway. They, they put a new version of Max out, what, every four years? And you have to totally relearn Max every four years. It's, it's, as long as you understand the basic concepts, you're fine. There. That's how you break in as an artist. That's my advice, right? And to be clear, I have hired literally hundreds of artists. And again, nothing is as important as you show up with that portfolio. You want to break in as an artist? You better have that portfolio. You should be doing the work that it takes to get that portfolio. And the number one thing that you can do Get a pencil, get a pad of paper, learn to draw. And you can start that from the time you're three years old. All right, how do I break into production and QA? All right, so I have some good news and I have some bad news on this one. You wanna break into QA? Okay, do it. 
It's like the easiest job in the world to get. Every big game company needs testers. Uh, if you go apply Electronic Arts or Big Fish Games or some, some go, go find a list of big game companies that are somewhere near you. Go apply as a job for a tester. You'll get a job as a tester. This is not a particularly difficult job to get. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that's officially the worst job in games. Um, you're going to work really hard. You're going to get paid peanuts and nobody's going to give you any respect. That's the reality of being a tester. That being said, you can be a tester like next week if you really put your mind to it. That's not a particularly hard job to get. Um, and it's a pretty good, my first job in games. And I would look at all those other jobs. If you want to be a coder, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a designer, if you want to be in marketing, and you're not finding that job, uh, being a tester in games is a way better job than, uh, you know, throwing burgers around at McDonald's. And it's certainly better than sitting around your room and bitching and moaning about the fact that you can't get a job as an artist. And that's what you always wanted to do, right? If you come to me and you say, I want to be an artist, and I've got this great art portfolio. And while I've been looking for a job as an artist, I spent the last year and a half as a tester for a game loft. I'm going to look at your portfolio a lot stronger than I'm going to look at the portfolio of somebody who hasn't spent the last year and a half working as a tester in a game studio. That's a fact, right? And being a tester in a game studio, that's where a lot of people enter a game studio and they move somewhere else. Where do those ass prods come from? Where do the assistant producers come from? Usually they come up from testing. Where does QA manager come from? QA manager is a good paying job. Comes from testing. Where do producers come from? They come from a lot of different places. Um, and if, you're, if you're, 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 your dream is to be a producer, they come from code. They come sometimes from art, but not very often. Um, they come from design and they come from testing. All three of those sort of are, are different paths that lead eventually to assistant producer, which lead to producer. And generally what happens is somewhere along the way, somebody who's a designer realizes that they like the management part of being in a game studio more than they like the design part or somebody who's a coder realizes that they like managing coders better than they like coding or somebody who's a, a tester uh, realizes that testing is a terrible job and they don't want to do it anymore and they become an assistant producer and they learn how to be a producer through that those are kind of the the traditional ways to get into production because production is by definition telling other people in the studio what to do you don't usually just walk into a game studio and start as a producer or an assistant producer. Usually you're going to have some other job experience in games before you get into that job. This is more like a mid-career move to, well, I did testing for a long time and I moved up to QA manager and I decided I didn't want to be a QA manager anymore, so I moved to production. Those people make great producers. Uh, people who came up through code make great producers. People who come through design make good producers. That's how you get into production. So usually getting into production is not a my first job in games job. That's just a fact. Uh, but testing, absolutely. You want to be a tester? The world needs testers and they get paid minimum wage. Have at it. Enjoy. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how that works. How to break into sound. Now, I actually... Um, I don't know, right? I don't know very much about sound. So before I did this, I went and I asked a couple friends uh, what their opinion was on how to break into sound. And I had two wonderful people. One is a guy named Thorsten Hines, who is, uh, he worked with me when I was at Crytek and he's been working in sound. He's a German fellow that lives in London and he's been in the industry for decades. And another is uh, Jeremy Goh, who's a Singaporean gentleman, runs a, a sound studio uh, Imba in Singapore. And so these are two people that, that they know sound. And when I asked, how do you break into current sound? I want you to read out what they said, uh, cause I think their advice is very good. So when Torsten was asked, he said, you know, basically, um, you're going to be either a sound effects artist or a musician. And rarely you're going to be both. Now, my my argument, this isn't Thorsten, this is my argument from sound people that I've worked with. Usually you're a great musician and an okay sound effects person or a great sound effects person and an okay musician. In a large studio, you can be just one or the other. But if you're trying to start your life and your career as a sound developer, I would suggest that you get really good at one of those two things and get at least okay at the other thing because a lot of studios are just going to want to hire one person. 
and they're going to want to know, yeah, yeah, you can do sound effects, but can you also do, uh, can you also do music? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I can do music, or at least I can work with musicians. I know enough about music that I can deal with that. Um, so that's kind of that. Now, he, what, what Thorsten was saying is to get things started, a great way is to put together a portfolio of sound. And you say, well, how do I put together a portfolio? How do I become a sound developer before I'm a sound developer? Well, just like everything else I've talked about, the tools and the things that you need are, they're already there. You can, you can grab a copy of OBS. You can record yourself playing a game for an hour. And then you can turn the sound off. Then you can go use any of a hundred off-the-shelf free tools that are available on the internet. And you can rebuild the sound in that game. This is a wonderful portfolio, right? Because you're not, you're not stealing anything. You took all the sound off. And the only thing you're doing is sound. That's totally legit, right? So if you come to my studio and you say, I want to be a sound designer. And I say, well, I don't know. Well, what's your sound like? And, they, and, they, and you pull out a copy of one of my games. And you say, well, I looked at your game and I thought I could do the sound better. So I recorded a bunch of sounds and I placed them in this video. Listen to your game with my sound. Or listen to World of Warcraft with my sound. That would be an incredible portfolio. And doing that experience over and over again, posting that experience up online um, and say, this is, this is how I would do this. Um, people are going to respond. You're going to get feedback and you're going to improve as a sound developer. That's a, a wonderful way to break into uh, the career of sound. Uh, you could create a mini game demo uh, with all of this content. Uh, but the, the important thing is that, 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 this, that, that you're highlighting specific skills, right? One, quality. Is the sound professional mixed down sound, right? And specifically, did you make a bunch of these sounds, right? You can go out and grab a bunch of sound libraries and, and put somebody else's sound in, but it's very difficult for me to judge you very well based on that. But if you're actually using programs where you're mixing sounds, you're taking sounds from these libraries and you're adjusting them, you're making them better, um, and you're doing that in a professional manner, that's something that's going to mean a lot to me. Um, variety is another big thing that you want to show. If you're going to show me a portfolio of sound, don't just show me 15 clips of you doing the same, you know, this is, this is me playing an FPS with a machine gun. This is me playing an FPS with a submachine gun. No, no, no. Show me a variety of sound. Look, here's my Mario style game with little video gamey graphics. Here's my, you know, moody whatever game with these sort of moody uh, uh, sounds, etc. So give me some variety. Um, and then write down why you chose to do the things that you chose to do. So that when the person who's trying to hire you is looking at your portfolio, they can say, oh, this is what they were attempting to do. They were trying to make the, you know, maybe for instance, um, and you see this, this is actually kind of interesting. If you go look on YouTube, you'll see people who have taken like a scene from a movie and they've put in a completely different sound mix and they've taken something that used to be a comedy and turned it into a horror film. And you can do that with sound, right? And to say that that's a thing that you were trying to do, you know, it doesn't just necessarily have to be just games. You could take a, a clip from a from a video. You could take a, a clip from a movie or a TV show, redo the sound mix, redo the, the vocals, etc. That's all stuff that you can do. So that was Thorsten's uh, advice, which I think is all very legit and very good. Um, uh, Jeremy uh, wanted to add uh, just knowing how to make a good sound music you know, just to make good make good sound and music isn't enough. You need to understand game engines at at least a high level, right? Um, and there's a lot of middleware out there that you can learn. And there's nothing stopping you from learning the basic tools that you as a game developer are going to use to put sound in games, Unity being one of them, right? Um, for any other game dev discipline wanting to get into sound design, just go out there and get a cheap microphone and force yourself to only use the sounds that you recorded into your game into a quality that you think is professional and acceptable, right? And this is this is a really great piece of advice. And learning just how to work with a microphone, how to do better sound with a microphone, learning how to adjust the sound in your room, these are, these are skills. These are sound development skills. And one of the best things that I will say about sound, and by the way, thank you very much, Thorsten and Jeremy, for your, your feedback on that, because I, I could not have answered this question alone. Um, one of the things that's really great about sound and the discipline of sound is, they're really, really nice people. More than any other game dev group online, the, the sound groups are like really supportive, really nice. Um, I think because they're underappreciated in the game. They, they, if you go to conventions and stuff, they're always sort of shoved in the back corner somewhere. They don't get the respect a lot of other developers get. 
And because of that, I think they're a very tight knit, very happy, supportive group. If you go into these communities and you start going through the tutorials and, and, and doing stuff and interacting with them, you're going to get a lot of support. And that's one thing I think sound has as an advantage over any other discipline in video games. So my daughter wants to go into sound and she wants to go to school. What should she study? Um, music. Uh, this, I can't think of any better reason to go to school and study music. And in fact, going into sound for video games is probably the most reasonable career option for somebody who has a, a, a BFA in music that I could possibly think of. It's like the most, you, that's, if you go to study music in college, that's like the most ridiculous thing you can study. That's the number one thing that your mom's going to be like, why are you wasting my money studying music? Being a sound developer in video games is probably one of the better paid, better jobs that you can get as a musician. So uh, by all means, uh, go study that in college. Or if you don't want to study that, May I strongly suggest that you go to a four-year college and get a degree in computer science. <laughs> if you want my real advice, go to a four-year college and get a degree in computer science. And while you do that, learn how to be a sound person and be a musician. That, that's my other real advice. Um, so next, how to break into localization. How can you be in localization? Um, this one is another one that I don't have a lot of... of great advice for. There's some people I probably should have talked to before I did this. Uh, the short version of this is most people I know who are in localization, they came into it through production or testing. And that's a great background. Most of, I mean, there's, there's, there's obviously jobs as translators. And if you want a job as a translator, getting a job as a translator for video games is much like getting a job as a translator for any other profession. Um, go do that. And we're one of the many places that hires translators. So I'm not going to explain how to do that to you. But there are other jobs in localization, being localization testers or being uh, uh, people who globalize games and that sort of thing. Those positions tend to come out of testing and QA. So that's or they come out of production. And so I think those are very reasonable ways to get into localization. If you're interested in going into localization of video games, I would strongly suggest going into it from that. What should you study in college? Well, um, may I suggest that you go to a four-year college and get a degree in computer science? Uh, I know that sounds like a broken record, but uh, why not? Um, it's as good as anything else. Uh, I, I don't know of a degree that you would get in I mean, I guess a linguistics degree or something, but I, I can't imagine looking at somebody's college, you know, as a guy who's hired people to do localization, I doubt that I would look at your resume and say, oh, you have a degree in linguistics. You would be better in localization. I don't actually think that's a, that's not really a thing. I mean, if you want to study linguistics, study linguistics. I, I guess that's a thing you want to do. If you want to study geography, I know, uh, there's some people that work in localization uh, that, that have geography degrees and they come from a geography background. Sure, that's great. But I wouldn't suggest, oh, you want to go into games localization, you should go get a geography degree. I just don't think that's a very strong degree choice. I mean, if it's something you really want to do, by all means, go do it. I got a degree in history. I can't, I can't complain. Uh, but I wouldn't do that because you wanted to go into localization. Um, I actually don't think your degree matters much in this. Instead, I think I would look at trying to work for other companies that do localizing surfaces. Um, I don't know, it's kind of a weird one to, to, to talk about. All right, marketing and business. Uh, how do you do that? All right, the business side is really easy. You do whatever you would do to get into any one of those business roles in any other career. Uh, legal people, finance people, licensing people, HR studio management, all of those roles in a game dev studio are very similar to what they would be if you worked at uh, Microsoft or Amazon or any other company. Um, basically, we're a tech business. And whatever you would do to get into one of those roles in a tech business is what you would do to get into that same role in the games business. You want to be in legal? Go get a law degree. That's a great way to go. You want to be in finance? Go be an accountant. Go get a degree in finance. Um, you want to be in business? Go get a business degree. Those are all legitimate things that you can do. I would say, though, that being said, if you came to me with an MBA and you'd never worked a day in games, I'm not sure I would be that excited about putting you in charge of my game dev studio. I have an MBA. 
Uh, I don't know very many people who have MBAs in the game dev world. There are at the at the large sort of high levels in the publishers. There's a few running indie game dev studios. There's not a lot of us. I found the things that I learned from getting an MBA useful. I found my career in game dev way more useful. So if you're really interested in getting into the business of making games and you want to be good at the business of making games, you might consider... Um, at the at the risk of saying it again, you might consider going to a four-year college and getting a degree in computer science and actually being a programmer in games for a while. Uh, that might be a thing that you consider. Um, but I mean, if you're going to be a lawyer in games, you're getting a law degree. If you're going to be an accountant in games, you're getting a finance degree. Those, those are um, those are normal things. On the marketing side, um, obviously there are marketing degrees. There are people who go to school and study marketing, and that is a very legitimate way to get into marketing for video games. In all of these roles, um, you know, these are very sort of straightforward things that you could do in video games that, you know, I don't need to explain to you how to get a marketing degree or to go into marketing. There's websites and things that will explain how to do that. The video game version of that is the same as everything. It's just we're video games. I would suggest that if you had something that explained to me that you had an interest, a real abiding interest in video games, plus the qualifications to be in marketing or the qualifications to be in finance or in legal, that would be a very compelling argument for you to get that job. And there's lots of things that you can do. You can do live streams. You can have a website where you talk about games. You can belong to a game dev group. You can go to game jams. There's all kinds of things that you can do to kind of be in games that doesn't involve being a game developer. Uh, that you could add to your qualifications for being a marketer or a, a licensing person or something like that that would make you a stronger candidate for these roles. And I would suggest if you're somebody, and I think a lot of times these are people who are sort of mid-career, you know, you're in your 30s right now, you've got a you got a, a, a degree in finance and you love video games, there's a game job waiting for you. And the way that you move from your current finance job into your game dev finance job is to convince the people with that game dev studio that you actually give a shit about video games. That would be my way in. Um, but this is pretty straightforward stuff. Also, I just want to say, you don't have to work in games to work with games, right? Um, there's a bunch of sort of corollary businesses that work around the games industry, supp supplying things to the games industry that you could be working in. Esports is a huge thing, makes billions of dollars every year. There's people that work in esports. Um, I don't have it on this list. People who run game dev conventions or work in conventions. I have a number of friends uh, that used to work here at BoomZap that actually work for game conventions and they organize game conventions and they're working in games, right? Um, People who do social media and live streaming. Um, and I'm not saying you should go out and be a live streamer. There's not a lot of money in that. Trust me, I know. But there are companies that deal with that. There are, there are ad agencies that work with live streamers. There's obviously uh, social media companies like Facebook that work with games. Uh, there's advertising companies. There's Tapjoy and I forget what else. There's a hundred different ad companies that buy and sell video game ads or put ads in video games. And that's a huge part of the game industry is if you go to a game convention, about a third of the companies there aren't even game companies. They're advertising companies. And those people are working with games. There's consumer products, people who actually uh, make the plush dolls for Mario and they make uh, licensed products and things like that. There's hardware. You can be, you know, go get an engineering degree and work in uh, the Microsoft Xbox group that makes, uh, uh, you know, the actual physical Xboxes, etc. There's a whole world of hardware jobs involved in games. Middleware and tool groups. Uh, you could go work for uh, Autodesk or uh, you, could, you could help the guys that build Photoshop. You could help the guys that build Unity. Those guys work in games. They, they don't make games. They're not game developers. They're not publishers, but they're at the game conventions in games, working with game devs every day. Those are all jobs that you could do in games. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, there's the platforms, right? You know who makes the most money in games? Back there when I showed you that chart of the top tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, uh, Valve, these big, huge platforms that sell video games. You could go work for those guys and they need people that work in business and people that work in tech and all these other jobs. So there's a whole bunch of other places that you could be working with games that aren't actually working in games. 
And when people say, I want to be in the game industry, I don't hear very many people talk about those things. Those are all legitimate careers in the game industry as well. So a couple final tips to getting a job in the game industry. Number one, don't be so picky about what kind of games you make. A lot of people are like, oh, I only want to make first person shooters. So I only sent resumes to companies that make first person shooters. If you're trying to break into, oh, I got all, my mother-in-law just brought me a, a fancy strawberry shake. I got all, oh, you know. Mm. Oh, I see. I got those. I must Sorry about that, but uh, that was really nice. My mother-in-law brought me a, a fancy little strawberry shake. Mmm. Fresh Japanese strawberries. Mmm. All right, back to what I was talking about. So don't be picky about what kind of games you're going to make. Um, you're trying to break into the industry. If somebody says they want you to work on um, SpongeBob SquarePants bowling. Go make SpongeBob SquarePants bowling. It doesn't matter. If you can get in, get in. Don't, don't, you know, I, I hear people and they, they're like, oh, uh, these are the five companies I want to work for. So I sent resumes to those five companies and they don't want me. So I guess I can't be in games. Nope. You can't be in games because you're a picky little bitch and that's not going to happen for you. Right. You go where the jobs are. You take whatever job they give you. That's how you break into the game industry. You don't get to choose when you start. Second, move into it, move to where the jobs are. I know a lot of people that like, I live in, you know, outer nowhere Stan, and I apply to the one game company that's in my neighborhood and they don't want me. So I guess I can't get a job in games. Nope. You can't get a job in games because living in outer nowhere Stan is more important to you than actually having a job in games. Like I said, a lot of the games companies are in like five or six different cities. There's a huge game dev community in, uh, in Japan and Tokyo. Uh, there's a one in Singapore. Uh, obviously, Los Angeles and San Francisco and Seattle are huge game dev hubs in Canada, Vancouver and Toronto uh, and Montreal are all big game dev hubs in Europe, uh, Paris and uh, uh, London and a couple other places. Uh, Dundee, of all places, are game dev hubs. Hamburg is another game dev hub. Berlin is another game dev hub. If you're wanting to make games, there's a high chance you're going to have to move to one of those cities. Uh, but there's also a, a chance that you're going to have to move somewhere very weird. And I'll tell you a quick story. When I got my, my breakthrough job, the job that really sort of made my career as a game developer and, and took me from being, you know, sort of a guy trying to make a career in games to being a guy that actually had a real solid career in games. It was when I got a job at Crytek. And Crytek, the guys that made Far Cry, at that time were in a tiny little Bavarian village uh, called Coburg and it's about an hour and a half more north of Nuremberg and nobody lived there nobody wanted to move there and they were downright desperate to get somebody to come be a games producer and nobody took the job because nobody wanted to move to literally bumfuck Bavaria I mean it was actually in Bavaria and it was actually the bumfuck part of Bavaria it was literally bumfuck Bavaria and nobody wanted to go there and they had very very few people apply for that job I was not incredibly qualified. I was nobody special. I was largely hired because they couldn't find anyone better. And I was willing to move to literally bumfuck Bavaria. That's a true story. And that changed my entire life and changed my entire career. And there are, and, and I would like to say that that game was special because I was there or whatever, but I'm smart enough to know that I was just lucky enough to be part of that team. And there are, a thousand other people that were looking for work at that same time that if they had been smart enough to send a resume to bumfuck Bavaria and go out to the interview and take the job in the middle of nowhere Bavaria, they could have been the guy that was the producer of Far Cry and they probably would have done just as good a job as me. But they didn't because they weren't willing to move to the middle of nowhere. So that's a big thing. If you want to break into the game industry, you're going to have to go where the job is. And when you're looking for work, don't discriminate. Send that resume everywhere you can think of that you can possibly get a job. And actually, those there's there's game companies in places like Edmonton that a lot of people don't want to move to Edmonton. And you know what? It's a lot easier to get a job up there than it is to get a job in Austin or San Francisco where everybody wants to work in games. Um, don't waste your time on wanted ads. I know a lot of people, they're like, well, every day I go to the you know four websites where they announce game jobs and I apply to whatever game job. Yeah, you and everybody else who wants games. Do you know how many times I've gotten a job based off of an actual job ad? Boink. 
Never. It's literally never happened. Every job that I've ever had in games came from me blind sending a resume to a game company and saying, I would like to work for you. I don't, as a, as a game uh, dev studio owner, I actually very rarely announce jobs that I want to hire for because I get resumes every day anyway. And when I want to hire somebody, I just go back through the last couple of weeks worth of resumes and see who sent me resumes. And most game companies work like this. You don't have to wait for a game company to announce a job opening to apply for a job at a game company. If you're interested in working in video games, what I strongly suggest you do based off of these tips is you sit down and you make a list. Start with all the game companies that are in your neighborhood, every last one of them, because hiring somebody local is always going to be easier for that game company. Start there. Next, list every game company you can find, right? And rank them in order of whether or not you'd like to work for them. Take you a day, two days, sit there and make yourself a big Excel sheet. Here's every game company world that I would like, that I'd be interested in working for, right? Um, and actually, it's every game company in the world, starting with the one I'd like to work for and ending with, wow, if every other company up here wouldn't hire me, I would work for these guys, but I would still work for these guys because I want a job in games and I'm not picky, right? And then every day, sit down, go investigate that company, go look at their website, go see what they make, write a nice little cover letter that obviously looks like it's not a... Uh, BCC of, you know, every other game company in the world. You know, I, you know, I noticed that you make these kind of games. I'm really interested in this, blah, this something about your game culture that I'm interested in. Write them a nice little letter. It'll take you about half an hour per letter and just sit every day, send out 20 or 30 of those. You put your mind to it. You can put 15 or 20 easily, 20 or 30 if you really work hard, right? Work through it. Send a resume to every single game company in the world. And sooner or later, you will get an interview. That's how you do it. Don't waste your time on wanted ads. The next thing, always, always, always be learning. You're going to have downtime. One of the bad parts about game industry is it's very difficult. It takes time. You're going to bang your head against that wall trying to get in for a very long time. While you're doing that, you should be learning. You should be working on your portfolio. You should be getting better at things. You should be... Uh, if you're an artist, you should be drawing. You should be putting those drawings up on DeviantArt. You should be getting feedback on those drawings. You should be correcting those drawings. If you're a designer, you should be making levels and putting those levels up. You should be reading articles about game dev. You should be reading articles about level design. If you're a programmer, you should be programming. That dead time where you're trying to get work is also time where you're getting better so that even if you get to the end of a year and you haven't gotten any jobs, you can go right back to the top of that Excel sheet and you can send letters back to all those people again and say, I applied last year. I want to show you what you, what I've done in the year since I haven't gotten the job, right? Um, look, I did this thing. I'm, I was in this game jam, et cetera, right? And that's the thing. Get involved. You live in 2020. You live in a world of a global internet where you can be part of so many communities. You can be part of, a, of an art community. You can be part of a game community. You can go to Reddit and be part of a group of people. You can be part of a beta test group. And let me throw this out there. If anyone is watching this and they're like, wow, I really want to get involved in game dev. And this Chris guy, he seems to know a lot of shit. I have a game. I need people playing my game. I have a discord where people talk about game dev and we talk about game balance and we talk about, we do that every day, right? You could come to our discord and you can do that thing. And if you're not into my game, Every game's got one. Whatever game you're interested in, instead of just sitting around and smoking dope and playing a game, why don't you go get involved in that game dev community? Go to their Reddit, go to their Discord, talk to the devs. There's all of that that you can do. Wherever you are, there's probably a game jam, jam near you. They do game jams like once or twice a year. Go to the game jam, work with a team, build a game. There are game conferences. Oh, but Chris, I can't afford game conferences. A little thing you don't know. Every game conference looks for volunteers. GDC looks for volunteers. Uh, uh, every, every, I, I could go through the whole list. I don't know where the conferences are. The internet knows. There's a list of conferences there on the internet. There's like 10 different lists of conferences. Volunteer for the conference. Go. Maybe you're just handing out leaflets, but for the cost of handing out leaflets, they'll let you go to a bunch of the, the lectures. They'll let you like walk around and talk to people. And you know what? If I'm, I go to ESGS Every single year. It's a game dev show in uh, in Manila. It's run by a, a friend, Jobert. Really good show. And there are three people in chat right now who I met at that conference in the student development group or who was hanging out with somebody I knew 
who said, oh yeah, this is so-and-so, they did this thing, and I hired those people. That's how they got the job that they have right now working for me, because they were in a, a student demo or a student group, or they, they, I don't remember what they were doing, but for some reason they were at that conference, standing in front of a computer showing people their work. And I went and looked at their work, and I thought, huh, that's a, that's a smart guy. Um, and some of them, Shutter Sky, for instance, um, Carlo is our marketing manager. I didn't hire him at the conference, but like a year and a half later, somebody was like, oh, you should hire my friend Carlo. And I was like, Carlo? Oh, yeah, I met that dude at a conference. I know that dude, right? And so this being involved, being there, that's how you get jobs, right? That's how you do it. Learn tech and get a decent computer. And I know you're like, I'm poor. I can't afford a computer. I promise you, you spent your money on some other useless bullshit. If you want to be in video games, um, you should probably have a decent computer. That's if you're going to spend your money on anything, spend, especially if you want to be in art and, and sound. Uh, both of those careers require a decent rig, a decent, decent setup, especially art. You're probably going to want a decent tablet. You don't have to have the fanciest tablet, but you have to have a tablet. Um, you're going to probably want a nice big monitor and you're going to want a machine that can run 3d art programs that doesn't chug real bad. If you're going to save up for anything, save up for that and, and do what it takes. You know, don't get that coffee at Starbucks. Don't go on that vacation. Don't do, if you're serious about getting in games, get yourself a decent computer, have the hardware so that you can do the work that you can, that you need to do to get the job. And, and last but not least, just toughen up. This is a very difficult industry. It's very difficult to get in. I hear a lot of people and they whine and they say, it's too hard, I couldn't do it. You can, and it's the people who toughen it up and they last and they keep applying for jobs even though people keep telling them no and they keep drawing even though somebody tells them that their art is crap and they keep designing cool card games even though people said their last card game wasn't any fun. One thing I will tell you about this industry is it is a constant battle of bashing your head against people telling you that you suck, people telling you that you're not good enough, people telling you your art is crap, your code is bad, your design is crap. You're going to do this. And even if you get in the game industry, your whole life in the game industry is going to be nothing but that. I'm, I've been making games for 20 some odd years and I still go to Discord and have some 19 year old kid who's never made a game in his life tell me, you don't know anything about video games, let me tell you how it could have been done right. And I don't go, you dumbass, let me tell you. I shut the hell up and I listen. Because that's what you have to do if you're going to be a game developer. That's the art of doing what we do. So toughen up. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to say, but this is not a friendly industry. This is not a place that's going to hug you and tell you it's all okay. The game industry is a rough place that's going to beat the shit out of you if you let it. And if you want to be part of this industry, you're just going to have to be tougher. That's a fact. All right. What about making my own company? Huh? There we go. I'll do that, Chris. I don't have to do anything you just told me about. I'm going to make my own company. I heard there's a guy in Vietnam that made Flappy Bird that got rich. I'll do that. Okay. Um, you can do that. That's a thing. That's a real thing, and you can do that. Uh, you can right now, if you have any skill at all with code, you can go grab a copy of Unity or, or Cocos or some other game-making program. And you can have a game up on the App Store within a week or two if you want. That's a thing you can do. Um, and maybe that'll work out for you. But I can tell you, because that's a thing you can do, it is a thing that literally hundreds of thousands of people do. And because of that, it's very difficult to get seen. Um, I will also say that making good games is a pretty difficult thing to do. Uh, it's hard. And you're going to put a lot of time and money into learning how to do that. I did not start my first company until I was deep in my 30s. And the reason I didn't do that is because I wanted to use somebody else's money to learn how to make all the mistakes that I was going to make. Because I, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a huge amount of very expensive mistakes at other people's companies. And they paid for that. And that was great. It, I got paid to go to game dev school. Uh, by the time I was ready to start my own company and, you know, start making even more mistakes, 
at least I'd gotten all those dumb mistakes out of the way and I made somebody else pay for it. And my suggestion to people is always that. Um, if you're good enough to make your own games, you're probably good enough to work for somebody else. And going and working in a game studio and learning from people who know how to make video games and interacting with them every day and learning this craft on somebody else's dime, that's a lot nicer than doing it on your dime. That's my take on it. But I don't want to steer you away from it. There are some people who are like, I've got a great idea for a little app. I'm going to go make that little app and I'm going to get rich. And by all means, do it. Some people do. I will say the bigger your game dreams are, the more I would steer you towards going and working for somebody first. If you've got a really cool idea for a, a simple little uh, hyper casual game and you think you can build it in a week or two, you know what? Go do it. Um, that's my honest suggestion. Just go do it. Go grab the editors or, or tools that you need and go build that thing and throw it up on the site and see if it works. Um, and in fact, there's a number of publishers out there, most of the hyper casual publishers, and you, you can find them. Just look at the front of your favorite hyper casual game. It tells you the name of the publisher. If you go to their website, most of those people are accepting hyper casual game submissions and they'll even throw a bunch of users and stuff at it. You can do that. You can do that right now. Um, but as you get to larger and larger and larger games, it's going to cost you more and more and more money and more and more and more time to build. And if you're building that without the experience of having worked for somebody else or done something else, I can tell you it's going to go slower. You're going to make a lot more mistakes. Uh, the work isn't going to be as good. And what's going to happen for the vast majority of you is you're going to get frustrated somewhere along the way because it's way harder than you thought it was going to be. And you're going to say, oh, to hell with this. I'm not going to make video games. This isn't what I want to do. And that's actually really sad because you were probably a good game developer. And had you done two years or five years at a studio somewhere and let somebody else pay for your mistakes, you probably could have gone and gotten a group of people and built that demo or built that game a lot faster and a lot better and a lot happier. And you would have said, oh, game dev is great and I love doing it. And so I do think there are a lot of great game devs that actually end up failing out of the game industry unnecessarily because they tried to go it alone too early. And I, I think that's kind of sad. Um, so that's my feelings about making your own company. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's up to you. All right. What about my tiny little kids? How do they prepare? I've got a four year. I, I get this. I get like old ladies or my granddaughter is really smart. And I, I know that she wants to make video games and she's only eight. Great. Math. Whatever it is, whatever it is you want to do, math. At school, study math. Um, this is the heart of programming. This is when people tell me they're good coders or bad coders. When we interview coders, the number one reason a coder is not a great coder is because they don't know the math. Um, knowing the math, not, not being able to calculate things quickly, but knowing how to put an algorithm together, knowing how to logically look at a problem and break that problem down into the logical components and figure out how to make an algorithm that intelligently and, and beautifully solves that problem. That's the number one thing coders do. And that means when you're very young and you're thinking, I want my kid to be in game development, the number one thing I would say, math. Um, I will say, you know, for those that want to be art, draw. I will, I will add draw. Um, there's nothing stopping you from handing your, your five-year-old daughter a sketch pad and a bunch of crayons and supporting her when she draws. There's nothing stopping you from doing that and putting those pictures up on your, your, your refrigerator and telling her what a great artist she is and putting her in art classes if she's interested in being in art classes, but just supporting that creative thing. That's what you do at an early age. Uh, but math, that and math. All right, that's it. That's what I've got. That's Chris's full, complete, I think damn near hour long answer to how do you break into the game industry? And I hope that's useful. I'm sure some people disagree with some of what I said. I'm sure some people have other experiences to share. I would love for you to share that with me. This is gonna be posted to YouTube. There's gonna be comments in the YouTube. I would love for you to fill that comment section with, what did I get right? What did I get wrong? What are your experiences? Because I wanna be able to send people to this video and I want those comments to also reflect the experiences of other people I know in the industry. I have a lot of friends in the industry. I know you all have experiences with this. And I would love for this to be sort of the one-stop shop for anyone who asks this question. 
We can send them there and we don't ever have to answer this question ever again. That's it. That's my final word. I'm done. Thanks.